In New Zealand, anybody can do any job he wants to, provided he has the qualifications. Whether he's Maori or European makes little difference. A Maori may be a photographer, a cabinet minister, or a timber stacker. It all depends on his ability and his choice. Maori's skill with heavy machinery is always in demand. Maori help has been invaluable on the big construction works. At Waipapa on the Waikato, brown and white New Zealanders are building their sixth hydroelectric station on the river. Working together, these men get to know that a man's worth can't be measured by the colour of his skin. At Ardmore, which is a teacher's residential college, students live and learn together. This is the ideal environment for getting to know one another, for realising the differences and the likenesses of Pākehā and Māori. Plenty of chances for appreciating Maori talent. Of recent years, there's been a quickening interest in the heritage of the Maori people. Adult classes in the language are popular and well attended. He, tepu, tene. This is a table. Literally, a table. This. This is the way the Maoris construct a simple. Sentence. Pākehās as well as Māoris are realising that it would be a pity to lose a language that is rich in imagery and poetry. Increasingly, native motifs and legends are an inspiration for New Zealand artists. Some of their best work springs from this source. When Europeans made contact with the Māoris about 150 years ago, they were fascinated by these vigorous people and were quick to record their impressions of them. Since then, there's been a steady flow of books on their legends, their history and their culture. Distinguished Māori scholars have been among the best writers on these subjects. These scholars have both sustained and revived the interest of their people in their own culture. The old-time Māoris were among the world's best woodcarvers and carving still a lively art. Today, most of the carving is done for meeting houses, which are the community centres for tribal gatherings. With each panel portraying an ancestor, tribal history is inscribed in the Whare Runanga. While new houses are being built, old ones are restored and sometimes enlarged. A fine meeting house is a community's pride. In front of the meeting house, visitors were made welcome with speeches and song and dance. The custom is still followed, and here members of a youth club are holding a dress rehearsal. In today's action song, the words are Maori and the melody European. Haka, or war dance, is a glimpse of the warrior past. The past is revered, but for members of the tribal committees, today's living is the concern. They deal with the local problems working in with the welfare offices of the Maori Affairs Department. 
Here, an officer is calling to tell a woman that her loan for a new house has been approved. Her present dwelling is one of many that needs to be replaced. Besides the tribal committees, there's the Maori Women's Welfare League. The women also have a good two-way liaison with the welfare officers, meeting them to discuss schooling, housing and the other aspects of adapting Maori ways to the modern world. Though in the last 15 years many hundreds of Maori families have become owners of attractive new homes, there's still a third of the Maori population living in poor conditions. To build homes for them and for the increasing number of newlyweds is a stiff problem. So much hinges on good housing, a happy family life, getting the best out of school and all the things that go with a home you can be proud of. From the Department of Maori Affairs, low interest loans are available and the department supervises the construction of the houses. In their new homes and gardens, the families, and especially the women folk, take great pride. They want to provide the setting that will give their children every chance of getting on in the world. It's the women who are keen on the children's schooling. Once, parents didn't worry much about school attendances, but that attitude has changed. Every week morning, just before nine o'clock, Māori and Pākehā children are flocking to school. In some districts where there's a predominantly Māori population, pupils are nearly all Māori. These, were not These all bright eyed, engaging youngsters are quick and keen to learn. Johnny's father had to go right up the valley. Here is a picture of the men going up into the valley. Most of the Māori schools are in the country and getting to and fro is often quite a feat. The children on Matakana Island have the country's unique school bus service. to travel across the tidal inlets and when the tide's in, the horsepower is almost swimming. But in spite of the slow and uncomfortable trips, there are seldom empty seats in the school buses. Roles in the secondary schools are increasing rapidly. Where once secondary education was the exception, now nearly all Maori boys and girls go to high school. In the past, there have always been the ambitious few who have aspired to the professions, but too small a proportion have qualified for skilled occupations. If swatting has not appealed to Maori youth, sport always has. In all games they are preeminent. So that more lads will acquire skills the government has established in Auckland a special apprentices school for carpenters. Here, boys from country districts are given an intensive training in all aspects of the building trade. These boys are good and will be keenly sought after by builders. In other trades, young Māoris are making their way with notable success. Pattern making is a highly skilled trade and so is optical fitting. The naval dockyards train many apprentices in civilian jobs. To get jobs, many young people must come to the cities, the urban drift as it's called. For Maori people, that applies more strongly as over 70% of them live in the country. The switch from country to city life can be rather unsettling. Learning to live like townsfolk is not easy. By providing and subsidizing hostels for apprentices, the government helps with the biggest problem, accommodation. In the past, Maori boys, because they couldn't find board, because they couldn't make ends meet on apprentices' pay, became lonely and unsettled, 
and often gave up their apprenticeships. Now, with help from vocational guidance and welfare officers, the boys are proving they have stickability. When they've served their time, there's no shortage of skilled jobs. In fact, if the Maoris are to keep pace with their fellow New Zealanders, more of them must enter the skilled trades. At present, they form 6% of the country's population, but they do not make up 6% of the skilled labour force. For the skilled, there are opportunities to set up their own businesses, as this silk screen artist has done. The great majority of the Maoris still live in the country. Along the east coast of the Bay of Plenty, between shore and hill, is a strip of land farmed by Maori families. From his home, Johnny Walker is going to plant his kumaras. Kumara is the sweet potato the Maoris brought with them in their migration from the Pacific Islands. Today, there is a good demand for them in city markets. On Bill Swinton's farm, a gang of neighbours and relations is haymaking. In pre-European times, cultivation and harvesting were always community efforts. And it's the way Maori people enjoy working today. Farming is one traditional occupation, fishing another. Henry Walker is a cray fisherman, and from the crayfish, for which this coast is renowned, he earns a comfortable living. Ben Keefe is another fisherman on this coast. For Ben, fishing is a part-time occupation to supplement his farming income. Ben's property is too small to be an economic unit and there are many Maori farmers like him. Bringing Maori farming up to high standards of production is beset with difficulties. Apart from holdings being too small, many of them have too many owners. Furthermore, much of the land is of poor quality and too remote to be used. Lack of capital and lack of up-to-date farming knowledge are further hindrances. To overcome these difficulties, there are two developments. One is for the owners to consolidate many properties and have them run on a large scale for their mutual benefit. The other, as here at Mokai, is for the government to develop large blocks of Maori land and then subdivide them. At Mokai, the Maori Affairs Department is developing a 7,000 acre block. When fully developed in a few years time, it will be subdivided into 30 farms. Some of the men working on the station will be the new farm owners. The department will lend them the money with which to start and supervise them for the first few years. Further north at Poa Kani, this scheme is working most successfully. Bernie Parker is farming 143 acres of good land which gives a useful income. His is one of 30 farms. Tom Hayata with a herd of 65 first-class cars leases another of the farms. Within a year or two, he will have repaid his loan to the department and will be farming without supervision. The Maori population is increasing rapidly and their land can't support all who live in the country. The old ways of a simple rural life with the farm feeding the family are passing. It's to the cities and towns that many will have to look for the future.
They'll always be sought after when brawn is needed, but to carry respect in the community, they must also be in demand when skill is necessary. Otherwise, all Maoris will be accepted as only fit for unskilled labour. But to retain the age-old traditions is essential in the shift to modern living. To take pride in their past gives a sense of security in these changing times with their subtle problems. In less than 100 years, they're trying to do what it's taken Europeans 2,000 years to do. The young people and the older people too can be proud of what has been achieved in their adjustment to the 20th century. And their fellow New Zealanders can share that pride with them. <laughs>